So as a seven time national champion at age group and senior levels, um, I don't want to be facetious here, but it does seem like you've got the whole national championships thing uh, down to a T. Um, you've been to four major championships now, I think. Hopefully it's going to be five by the end of this season. Yeah. Uh, how does competing in so, sort of European and world championships differ from other competitions? And do you have to change anything in your preparation for those events in particular? Yeah, for sure. I think with British competitions, um, I'm, at the moment, I'm like maybe ahead by the second best in Britain by maybe close to a metre. So I, when I go to these competitions, I have a little bit more confidence and less nerves because I think, OK, well, the chances are that I'll probably win. So it's, it's, it's easier in a way, but it's also mentally hard because I might not jump as far as I'm capable of. But then when I go to a European or world level competition, suddenly everybody's maybe jumping close ahead of me or you know and then suddenly I have to find that um the the belief in myself I am good enough to be here so even though I'm the best in Britain it's sometimes challenging when I'm then against people who are better than me but I've definitely been working on that and I often pull out some of my best performances when I'm competing against people who are better than me I think it's because I really it's almost like I don't want to be embarrassed <laughs> so I, I always will pull out the, my best performances in terms of preparation I think the main difference would be traveling um, often competitions here, I'll just kind of drive down, stay overnight and compete. Um, if the competitions are abroad, sometimes we'll have training camps two weeks, three weeks long, um, trying to get used to the time zones and the climate and everything. Um, so it can be quite hard being away from family for, for that long, but it's just part of it and it's a sacrifice. And um, yeah, that's probably the, the thing that differs. How are you feeling in terms of the Olympics? Obviously, preparation has been very, very uh, not, not a traditional Olympics, right? Yeah. Um, how, how are you feeling for this summer? Because um, obviously it would be your first one. So um, how are you feeling for that? Um, it's kind of, it, at first, I, I would, like say if the Olympics was in 2020, I don't think I would have been ready for it. Um, I think then I was still, I was still working part time. I just finished my degree. You know, I, I was not quite mentally ready for the whole Olympic Games, but this time I'm feeling really prepared, really motivated. And for once, I actually think, yeah, do you know what? I'm good enough. I'm really going to give this a, a shot. Um, so I, I'm excited. I, I just keep hoping that everything goes ahead and hopefully there'll be a crowd because in the triple jump, you want the crowd to get behind you in every jump. Um, so that's kind of my, my hope. But I'm, I'm excited for it. Awesome. Um, so you picked up a bronze medal at the 2017 European Juniors in Italy. Would you say that that's so up to this point, that's been your greatest accomplishment in, in the sport so far? I'd say that in terms of medals, yes, I think that's the biggest medal that I, that I got. Um, but I think in terms of achievement, it was the year after I made the, the European Senior Final. Um, and I beat people who got Olympic medals um, just to make that final. So for me, I, I, I was over the moon because I was just going there mainly for experience. So to actually make it be top 12 in Europe was, was huge. But that bronze medal was a, probably one of my favourite moments because I was in fourth place for basically the whole competition. And in the last round, I, I beat the, the girl um, ahead of me by four centimetres to get the medal. So that was, that was a pretty awesome moment. That must have been a pretty frosty handshake after. <laughs> yeah, she <laughs> hands. <laughs> um, Whilst we're talking about those championships, uh, could you maybe tell us about the, the medal ceremony? Did it go to plan or were there any hitches? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. So yeah, we stood on the podium, you know, the flag sort of raised up. There's um, me in third, the Great Britain flag, and then this the silver with France, and then there's Belarus in first. But then the anthem plays and the um, first place um, lady from Belarus sort of frowned and then she walked off the podium and then she kind of folded her arms and I was like what is going on I just awkwardly stood there like what later I realized that they played the wrong national anthem completely they played it for in Bosnia I think it was Bosnia uh, a different country completely and um, the video racked up millions of views on YouTube and all the national Belarus the Belarusian um, the newspapers so pretty big name there but um, yeah that was a, a big mess up but we got to redo the ceremony in the next um, the following days but yeah I couldn't believe that I was in that moment it was so crazy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about balancing life as an elite athlete with school and university because um, although not all of us can relate to being national champions, I'm pretty sure that everyone 
watching has experienced the challenges of balancing kind of outside interests and activities with school. Um, how did uh, and do you approach time management and maximising your productivity? Um, I think for me, it was, it was really important to sort of write down everything that I've kind of got going on. Because sometimes you can think you can store information in your head, but sometimes just writing it down, having it out, a calendar um, or, or just a to-do list just makes it a little bit more clear and a little bit less anxiety inducing when you think you've got so much going on. And sometimes it's not as much as you think. I think another thing that really helped me was keeping my tutors and my teachers informed of everything that was going on outside of um, school. And even if it's not sports, I think sometimes, you know, with, with mental health and all sorts of things, I think it's good to keep your teachers informed um, of what's going on because you, you don't know the sort of provisions that are in place that can help you. So that's definitely what, what I did. And I think having support from my parents and a bit of a nudge here and there where maybe I was watching Netflix or not really doing any work, my dad would be like, you know, you do realise that I'm sure you have an assignment, you know, due. And I think having somebody to hold you to account um, when you maybe are slacking a little bit does help. So I did let my parents know when I had so certain assignments, like big ones, um, just in case I uh, was slacking. Um, but a lot of my work I had to do on coaches and uh, on, the, on a high jump mat sitting there, you know, at a competition trying to get it done. But I think it, it definitely is possible to balance things alongside studies. And I think it is beneficial as well. Did you find that you had to make a lot of sacrifices in terms of university and school? Because obviously there's a lot of um, pressure in terms of, especially when you go to university, I think, to like uh, socialise and to do lots of the things that everyone else is doing. Um, did you find that you had to make a lot of compromises in that regard? Yeah, I definitely did. I, I did choose to live at home because, and I even even the choice of going to University of Manchester, the main one of the main reasons was just so that I can continue training with my coach, who's obviously based in Manchester. So I think that within itself of not moving away, not kind of getting to experience that whole student sort of life and just staying at home was was a bit of a sacrifice. And then obviously when it came to like parties and socials, I couldn't um, go to a party and then train the next morning because I, I just it just wouldn't work. So it was missing a lot of friends' birthdays and stuff. But in the times where, you know, it was off season and didn't have anything, then that was great. I got to <laughs> finally have like a little few weeks where I could do everything. But other than that, it was, yeah, a lot of heads down or working out. I think it's something that you touched on just now. And it's sort of the topic, which I think is really important, of kind of the relationship between sports and mental health. Uh, even from my limited experiences in sport, uh, the link between the two is huge. So when you're playing or competing well, it can have such a positive impact on your mental health, um, but it can also work the other way around. So when you're mentally healthy, um, it allows you to both perform better and also handle poor performances better. Um, how important is mental health to you and how do you go about managing it? Um, so yeah, I'd say, um being just being aware of how I'm feeling something that's very important to me and I I'm always trying to speak to people even though sometimes I feel like I'm bugging people I think that it's, it's always good to speak and it can be difficult but just having conversations and talking about how you're feeling definitely helps um with triple jump it's, it's slightly different to grades I used to find universities sometimes a lot more um difficult mentally than than triple jump when I do a jump I get my results straight away and I know that I've jumped and then I get another five goals to to try and improve it with it with my grades you know I'd submit an assignment and then you're waiting for maybe a week two weeks to get that result back and then with that delayed sort of you know getting the result and maybe not being happy with it it could allow make me beat myself up but I think what I've learned from triple jump is that you always have another chance, like even though you might have done bad in one assignment, but that's not your whole degree. And that's the, the beauty of the, the way degrees are set out with all the modules and all the different percentages. So I think sometimes instead of dwelling on what you've done wrong, OK, let's focus and move on to what can I have done better and how can I kind of use that in the next thing? Um, and, and that's definitely what's helped me out. Um, so I think in a way, having that, what I've learned from academics has helped me triple jump and vice versa. Awesome. I think that moves us on quite nicely to the um, next question I wanted to ask you, which was about uh, your platform that you've created. So Three Point Start, um, because it certainly seems like a really interesting um, and perfect platform for athletes to share their stories uh, and for um, those who are maybe reading the articles uh, and blogs and stuff to kind of understand a little bit more about what goes on in the minds of athletes. So could you maybe talk a little bit about the platform itself uh, and what it does and where you want to take it in the future? 
Yeah, so I created um, Three Point Start during the first lockdown. Um, I did a lot of reading. I sort of learned how to make a website and used lots of YouTube to learn graphics and things. And I just really wanted to push myself and kind of everything that I love in media and sport, put it all together. And one of my main things was to get um, and use content creators and writers of people who are up and coming, maybe they've just graduated from uni, maybe they want experience, and then teaming them up with up and coming athletes or maybe Paralympians or athletes who people maybe not so aware of. Um, so that's kind of what's motivated me. And I wanted it to be a really youthful, sort of energetic and positive um, outlet for sports media. So yeah, that, that's kind of what I created. So that's in threepointstart.com if you want to check that out. <laughs> we spoke about 2017, but in 2019, you actually were on the other side of um, coming third stroke four. Um, and you just missed out on a medal at European under 23s by not too much. I think it says 15 centimetres here, which is not not loads. Um, but most notably, you qualified first to get into the final. Yes. Um, so how did you go about kind of dealing with that? Was it much of a disappointment to you? And uh, how was that for you? Yeah, so it was a, it was a very a strange one for me because I that was my big goal of the season was to win under 23s. The year prior, I was the number one 23 under 23 in the world. So I thought, well, at European level, you know, it should be it should be fine. And I was going in there, um, especially to the final rank number one. But by my first jump, I, I I think that was the I don't even know what happened. I think I just just couldn't quite put it together. And I feel I, I felt a lot of that pressure for, for the first time. Um, but then I, I kept going over to my parents and it, it was, yeah, I kept going over to my parents and just thinking, I don't know if I can do it. And then my dad was like, no, keep going. And this was mid-competition. So as you can see, mentally, I was really, really struggling. Um, and then in that last round, I actually produced my best jump, got into third place. But then the lady from Turkey, she just overtook me the same way I did last year. But at that point, I... I, I um, I wasn't, I was disappointed, of course, but it didn't crush me or anything. Um, and I just was thinking forwards, as I said before. But what I learned from them, from those moments is kind of, I think I was struggling and I didn't realise. So leading up to it, my grandma had passed away um, in March and I was like, I'm going to dedicate this next competition to her. I went to the British Championships indoors. I jumped to uh, indoor personal best. And then from there, it just started going sort of down because I hadn't really dealt with the fact I'd lost my grandma. I hadn't spoken to my coach about it. I hadn't spoken to anyone. Um, so I was I was actually struggling more than I knew. So when I went to this competition, perhaps in my head, these things were going around and I didn't know. So that's why I think it's super important to, even if you think that you're over something, just to keep talking about it and try and just identify, you know, is could there anything you know, could there be anything wrong? And then not being too hard on yourself if things go wrong, because life isn't perfect. And there's always other opportunities to show um, what you can do. So yeah, hopefully um, with the Olympics and things, I can sort of redeem myself there and, and show what I can do. But I've not really dwelled um, back onto that competition, to be honest. But, you know, fourth in Europe, it's not, it's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> you can't complain too much about that. Things could be a lot worse. Um, and the last one is, I just wanted to get you to talk a little bit about your experiences working with the BBC. So you, uh, helped out a little bit for their coverage of the world champs in Doha. Um, like you mentioned before, presenting was something that's always been on your radar. Um, how much did you enjoy it? And how did you find out that you were going to do it in the first place? Yeah, so as I said, I've always loved presenting and I sort of um, started off doing like little vlogs and somebody from BBC actually saw my blog on Instagram and they, they weren't getting loads of views. Like sometimes I'd be discouraged because they'd maybe only get like a, a couple of views. Um, but yeah, somebody from BBC saw. So when I didn't qualify for the championships um, to compete, I got a phone call and it was like a random number and I was like, what? And he was like, hi, I'm called whatever so-and-so and I'm the head of sports production of BBC and we'd um, love for you to come over to Doha. Yeah, you're going to, you know, we'll fly you over um, 12 days. You can present with Radzi. You'll sit, you'll sit with Gabby Logan. And and I was like, is this a prank? Like, this must be a <laughs> like, This makes no sense. And it was honestly, as quick as that, I had to ring work and I was like, um, I've just been asked to go <laughs> and present for BBC. Like, can I have two weeks off? And they were like, okay, one sec, let's just check. And um, so the, I got work booked off and literally within the next two weeks, I was in Doha. Um, they really threw me into the deep end, but I, I enjoyed every minute and he stuck to his word. I sat next to Jess Ennis, Gabby, I did everything, presented with Radzi and it was it was like, yeah, a dream come true. Like young me was like, yep, yeah, this triple jump thing, <laughs> it yeah. definitely to my dream. So yeah, it was amazing.